Okay, what is going on everyone? I'm just out here for my regular morning walk here in Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, I will say it's a little bit cold in Jacksonville today. In fact, I think it's, I think it's the coldest it's been since I've been here. Um, I think it was five degrees Celsius when I left the house this morning. And I think I am coming down with a little bit of another cold. Uh, so if you hear that in my voice in this video, uh, please just excuse me. Um, but in this video, I, what I wanted to do was sort of make just a recap video on some of the things that I think I skipped in my original video on sugar and respond to a bunch of the questions that I've gotten about that video and I guess just engage with some of the general conversation that's been happening around the topic of sugar since I published that video. If you didn't see that video, I'll put a link to it up here somewhere in the cards. Uh, you may want to watch that first before watching this one. Um, but in any case, I just wanted to do a sort of walk and talk video addressing some of those topics. For those of you who are interested in having a little bit more uh, deep insight into some of the peripheral topics around sugar. Um, and just for your own discretion, uh, I don't plan to do like a fancy edit with this or anything. I'm actually just filming on my cell phone right now with a lapel mic. Um, and that's just for the sake of time. Uh, I've got to get to work on my next Myth Bus Monday video, but I did want to get this out there. Um, so if you do have a short attention span, um, this may not be the best video for you. Um, but in any case, I wanted to address what I believe to be the three main or three most frequent questions that I've got um, or three most um, frequent points that were raised about my video. And so the first one is about insulin. Um, so just so we're all on the same page, Insulin is basically a hormone responsible for taking glucose out of the blood and shuttling it into muscle, liver, and fat cells. And sort of related to that, it also is responsible for inhibiting lipolysis, or the breakdown of fat, and stimulating lipogenesis, or the formation of new fat. And I think it's for these latter functions that insulin really gets a bad rap. And I think by extension, Sugar gets a bad rap because sugar is, of course, a very powerful stimulator of insulin release. Um, and so, by extension, because of these functions, it goes that sugar is basically making us fat on this mechanistic level. Um, I think that this argument is flawed uh, for a bunch of reasons. Um, I'll just give my top three. Um, the first is basically that the point is kind of moot because sugar is not the only thing that stimulates insulin release. Um, in fact, any complex carbohydrate or any carbohydrate in general will cause insulin release. And not just that, protein is also a very powerful stimulator of insulin release. Um, in fact, in one study, they showed that when you fed subjects a high protein, low carb diet, or if you fed them a, or I should say a high protein, low carb meal, or you fed them a high carb, low protein meal, you saw very similar levels of insulin release. And in fact, the high protein, low carb condition actually saw slightly more insulin release, uh, but this didn't reach statistical significance. Um, and I think that this point is particularly salient in the case of people consuming mixed meals, where insulin release is going to be blunted to a degree anyway. Uh, it's not like people are just eating meals of only table sugar um, or something like that, at least not very frequently. Um, secondly, even if it were true, uh, I think it's irrelevant because a high sugar diet doesn't cause insulin to be chronically elevated, uh, just transiently elevated. And so after you eat a meal, insulin levels will rise uh, and lip lipogenesis will be high for that time period. And then in between meals, when you're not eating, um, basically lipolysis will exceed lipogenesis while insulin is low. And as long as net caloric balance is zero, these two processes will essentially cancel out and net fat balance will be zero uh, at the end of the, the 24 hour period. And by extension, if you're in a net energy deficit, then lipolysis will exceed lipogenesis over the course of the uh, 24 hour period. And uh, the, the insulin lulls will sort of uh, exceed the insulin highs and you will lose fat overall, net fat balance will be negative. Um, so that puts it in a little bit more context, uh, hopefully. And the third reason why I think that the insulin point is somewhat irrelevant is because insulin is not the only hormone responsible for storing fat. In fact, even if you were to eat a zero 
sugar, zero carbohydrate diet, you could still get very fat uh, if you ate enough calories because of a hormone called acylation stimulating hormone or ASP. And this will just shuttle any fat in your diet directly into the fat cells. Um, so I think it's wrong to pin down insulin as a primary driver here. Uh, I think, like I said in the video, um, overconsumption in general, of which sugar is a part, is the main issue here. Okay, so the second concern that I have, or the second concern that's been voiced to me about sugar intake, probably actually the most frequent one, is that sugar is addictive. And this addictive quality causes us to overeat on it, or overeat it. And, and I think that this is not correct. I think it's more accurate to say sugar has addictive-like qualities, not that it is truly addictive in the same way that something like heroin or cocaine would be addictive. And I think the common sense argument uh, for this, or for what I'm saying, is that you don't tend to see people go right to the bag of table sugar and just have to get their fix no matter what. You always see sugar being eaten ravenously in the context of a whole, some sort of food product. Um, so it, it tastes very good, um, it's packaged in a way that looks maybe aesthetic, um, maybe smells good. And so it's this sort of general sensory overload, this general hyper palatability, I think that's driving that overconsumption of sugar, not something truly addictive about sugar itself. And notice that this isn't true about things like heroin that are actually uniquely addictive. Uh, you would see people having to get their fix of heroin really regardless of how good it tasted or, or anything like that. Now, a lot of people will point out that there has been some research showing that when you feed rats sugar, the same dopamine centers, centers in their brain uh, tends to light up in a very similar way that you see when you give them cocaine. And this has led a lot of people to believe that sugar is as addictive as cocaine, excuse me, is as addictive as cocaine. Um, and I think that this is misplaced because when you look at other rodent research, you see that if you knock out the taste buds in those rodents, they suddenly stop overeating. And I think that this seems to imply that it's the taste that's driving it, not necessarily some addictive property about sugar itself. And furthermore, if you package sugar with some substance that when the rats eat it, it makes them sick or it makes them throw up, they suddenly become averse to that sugar bolus. This is called devaluation. And when you devalue other drugs like say cocaine or heroin and feed it to rats, they will continue to eat it or they'll continue to consume it even if it's making them sick. And this indicates true addictive qualities, uh, true addictive qualities of those substances. So with that said, I don't think it's the case that people aren't over consuming sugar or it may not be a good idea for some people to moderate their sugar intake. Uh, I think it's a good point that we notice that people will say there's always more room for dessert and there's a reason for that and it's because it tastes very good. And so we need to be mindful of these hyper palatable foods. Um, but I do think that again, this is an issue of the sheer availability of highly processed, hyper palatable, very tasty foods that are just always at our disposal and less an issue of some specific unique quality of sugar in and of itself. And I just remembered another common thing that came up a lot uh, was actually to do with insulin. So we're just going to flip back to insulin for another second. Uh, and it had to do with insulin sensitivity. Um, so the idea goes that increasing sugar in your diet or having maybe any sugar in your diet will cause you to become less insulin sensitive or more insulin resistant. Um, and as a healthy individual, you want your insulin sensitivity to be high. This basically means that your cells respond well to the hormone insulin. And this shuttles glucose out of your blood, which of course puts you at less risk for conditions like diabetes, obesity, metabolic syndrome, et cetera. And I think that this has some <laughs> legitimacy, um, you know, especially in the case of individuals or on the individual level. Uh, if you have someone who is eating or drinking, say, a two liter of Pepsi every day, uh, certainly, especially in the case of overconsumption in general, that's going to have a negative impact on their insulin sensitivity and simply eliminating that soft drink would have a positive effect on their insulin sensitivity. Um, I don't really think anyone would necessarily 
deny that. Of course, it will depend on context and the rest of their lifestyle and so on. Um, and that's sort of my point here is that insulin sensitivity, just like diabetes in general, is a complex issue and it's multifactorial. And in this case, it depends on a, a whole host of factors, uh, not limited to very strong genetic factors and also lifestyle factors. That includes regular exercise or your exercising habits and your diet in general. And I think that to pin down sugar as the single thing driving negative changes in insulin sensitivity is very narrow in focus and a little bit misled. Um, and I think this because when we look at the research that matches groups in eucaloric conditions, so both groups are at a net caloric balance of zero, roughly speaking, whether you feed them a very high sucrose or a very high sugar diet or a low sucrose diet, you don't see any differences in insulin sensitivity across six weeks in those healthy subjects. Um, so this leads me to think that, again, the main problem is overconsumption. Now, certainly sugar is a player in that overconsumption. I don't think anyone would deny that. Um, however, I think, like I said, to pin down sugar as the central cause or the central thing causing changes in insulin sensitivity uh, is misplaced. And I think that some of the best things you can do for your insulin sensitivity is to regularly exercise and to have a healthy diet in general. And basically that means focusing on eating minimally processed whole foods, foods that are rich in uh, vitamins, minerals, and very high in fiber, uh, and place a special focus on increasing your consumption of fruits and vegetables. I think that's probably some of the best advice you can give for improving insulin sensitivity. So the third thing I'm gonna do my best to cover here, uh, I definitely won't be able to cover everything, so like I had done in the previous video, I'll have a bunch of other stuff, additional resources linked in the description below. Um, but that has to do with the idea that fructose is somehow a unique player here. And in some sense, it is worse than other sugars like, say, glucose. Um, and I think that this comes from the basic idea that glucose is metabolized by every tissue in the body, at least to my knowledge. Uh, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong on that. I think glucose can be metabolized by every tissue. If not, it's certainly almost every tissue. Um, whereas fructose is limited to metabolism almost, I think, exclusively in the liver. And this is drawn the comparison of fructose to other things that tend to be considered toxic, like alcohol, which are basically detoxified and sort of filtered by the liver. Um, and I think that this is a misplaced judgment because what makes something toxic is basically whether or not it has deleterious health effects, not whether or not it's metabolized in the liver. Um, and this is always dose dependent. So even the most truly toxic thing on the planet, uh, the botulinum toxin, uh, is only toxic at a certain dose. And the cosmetic industry knows this very well, and it's why when they do Botox treatments, they only use a very, very, very tiny amount of botulinum. And this is because this toxin is actually more toxic than nerve gas and plutonium. Um, now, when we're talking about fructose, it just simply isn't toxic in this same way. Uh, we're looking at a completely different scale, um, and I don't even think it really makes sense to use that terminology. Um, I think that, like I said in the original video, that's a bit of that emotion-raising language that anti-sugar advocates really use um, to try to sort of heighten their claims. Um, the other big thing uh, about fructose is that it's claimed to increase or, or to be more fat generating than other foods and other sugars. And the idea is that sugar is ingested, goes directly to the liver, and there it's uh, metabolized and converted into fat. And then that fat is stored in the liver and contributes to fatty deliver, liver disease and a whole host of other problems. Um, and to my knowledge, this is, again, not based on a fundamental understanding of fructose metabolism. Uh, I'm drawing some of this information from an interview with Brad Dieter, um, which I'll link in the description box below. He has a, a PhD and has actually done a lot of research um, in this field. And the basic idea is that when fructose is ingested and you radioactively label it, you basically find that about half of that fructose, when it hits the liver, 
is immediately converted into glucose. And roughly the other half is converted into lactate and then shipped out to other tissues. And only about 1% of that fructose is actually converted into fat. And this remains true even at very high doses of fructose, up to I think 100 or 150 grams, which is a lot. Um, so that's gonna conclude my uh, basically I guess initial thoughts on some of the, the controversy and the conversation that resulted from my video on sugar. Um, I can't possibly get to everything, so I've linked a whole bunch of material in the description box below. Um, this is a topic that I find really interesting, which is why I decided uh, to do this sort of walk and talk video. Um, if this is something that you guys liked, please let me know. Um, if I am going to be covering more controversial topics with the Mythbust series, then I expect to get some pushback, and I actually encourage that. I think it's, it's a good thing to have a conversation about this sort of stuff, because it is kind of more important stuff, and it is something that I personally find very interesting. Um, so just let me know what you think uh, down below. If you did like the video, if you found it clarifying in any way or helpful in any way, uh, please leave me a thumbs up. And I will see you guys all in a couple days uh, for the next Mythbust video.